Tower of Ally McBeal. Now, stay tuned for the American League Division Series on Fox. Tonight in Cleveland, we stand with an unbelievable Game 5 at hand. There have been only two Game 5s since the birth of baseball's divisional battles. In 1995, Ken Griffey headed home and his team never looked back. Then in 1997, right here on this very field, a fantastic Final Five was played. Into left center field, Giles is there. Celebrate! This past weekend, a massacre occurred. But it wasn't the Bostonians who cried. It was the Clevelanders who died. Now we return to Cleveland, where the Red Sox are truly reborn and are led by their surprising hero, John Valentin. But the tribe are home, where they always let it fly. The Red Sox and the Indians are ready to shake the jake and see who survives the do or die number five it's boston and cleveland in game five next on fox for the second time in their history the indians try to win the fifth game of a division series at home the noise at jacobs field may be worth 50 runs a year to the indians they could use them tonight if the Sox were 23 again pedro martinez is throwing tells us he could throw a couple of innings tonight but he's not starting Steve has important information about what his injury may really be and if it will affect his future. From Fox Park, where we know better than to sing Daryl, Daryl, or Manny's Hitless at anybody, it's the American League Division Series Game 5 pregame show alongside Steve Lyons. I'm Keith Olbermann, and one team has scored 32 runs in the last two games, and it's not Cleveland. John Valentin has 10 RBI, Dave Justice is benched, and Manny Ramirez is hitless in 15 at-bats. Steve, what's wrong with this picture? It is the exact opposite of what we thought we'd see. We thought the Indians would come in there with their huge bats and score a lot of runs. And the Red Sox, all those nobodies that people have been talking about, and by the way, they hate it when you call them nobodies, but that's what makes them a great team. Everyone thinks they're not worth being out there on the same field. They forced a game five because they have big hearts, and that sometimes can do it for you. Big heart, not a big body, Pedro Martinez, and his bad back may have pay, uh, permitted Pedro to dance in the dugout to the sounds of Mambo number no. five between innings last night, but apparently it won't allow him to start this evening. Jimmy Williams instead turns to Brett Saberhagen, who was lit up like Christmas by the Indians in game two. The winner in that one, New Englander Charles Nagy, goes for Cleveland. Steve, Pedro can dance. Why can't Pedro start? Well, because I wouldn't be surprised at all to find out a little bit down the road that this is not a back injury at all and that it is a shoulder injury. Maybe the same shoulder injury that put him on the DL right after the break. Check this out. Game one, fourth inning, a 96-mile-an-hour fastball that strikes out Jim Tomey. Right after that, what is that move right there? That's a move of some guy who's hurting a little bit. He faced two hitters after that. He faced Baines and then Justice. He only threw two fastballs to both of those guys. Neither of them reached 90 miles an hour, and he got them out on changeups. Granted, he has a great changeup, but it looked like the kind of guy who said, I can't get my fastball up there anymore. This guy's worth $12 million a year. I do not pitch him if I own or run the Red Sox at the risk that I ruin him for a long time after this. I wouldn't be surprised to see him shut down for the rest of the year if he doesn't get better. Yeah, this gesture either means you're hurt or you're landing. Planes. Yeah, because I didn't see any flashlights in his, hand, in his hands, or he wasn't doing that two-finger point like this. Nothing. From the NL playoffs, late word that Cookie's crumble will cost him a five-game suspension. Mets third base coach Cookie Rojas, who shoved ump Charlie Williams over that foul ball in the ninth inning, has had his fortune written for him. He will sit for five, raising the interesting question, what happens if the Braves sweep the Mets in four in the NLCS? Across town, the question is about Paul O'Neill. That bruised rib of his fractured. The break only discovered today after additional x-rays and an MRI. He heard it nine days ago and did not play in the Yanks' third game on Saturday. They can wait till 10 a.m. Wednesday to set their playoff roster, and apparently Joe Torre will. Well, back to our series, Steve, summarize this. What's going on here? Well, how has this happened? The Red Sox are back in this series because they've exposed the weakness that is the Indians, and that is their pitching staff. And I'll tell you what, the Red Sox are swinging the bats with a vengeance. John Valentin is a guy who could have buried himself in this series, but he wouldn't let it happen after that error in game one. Valentin, unbelievable, in an eight at-bat stretch. He has six home runs, or six at-bats, six hits, three home runs, two doubles, a single, and ten RBIs. You got to remember that before Nomar hit the scene, this guy was the best, second best player on that team outside of Mo Vaughn. Manny Ramirez, on the other hand, 0 for 15, just stinking it up for the Indians. He struck out six times. This is a guy that drove in 165 runs during the year, and they need his leadership. Charles Nagy, probably the freshest pitcher that either team has going. He's a Red Sox killer. He's 10 and 1 lifetime against these guys, and when he doesn't get the strikeout with balls low and away, he gets the ground ball double plays. He could be the huge key to this game five. 
Brett Saberhagen will go for the Red Sox. Saberhagen's going because he's a warrior, not because he's the same pitcher that won a Cy Young in 85 and 89. He's the only guy the Red Sox have left. They're going to hope that maybe Derek Lowe can come back and pitch a couple more innings as well because he's spent. But no, uh, Alomar, Vizquel, and Harold Baines just ate Saberhagen up in this last game that he pitched. The bottom line, Sandy Alomar, Lofton, Justice, Tomey, and Ramirez in a deciding game since 1995. All of them together hit under 200. They have to break out if they want to win this game. All right, when we continue, a team down 0-2 rallies to force a fifth game. What happens then? We'll look into that, and we'll look at Brett Saberhagen. Five hits, three walks, six runs, and two and two-thirds in game three. What happens tonight? Stand by. For only the eighth time in baseball history, a team has come back from down two zip to force a fifth game in a best of five series. The Red Sox, the latest of the undead. History suggests their odds are decent tonight. Four of the seven teams previously in this situation have won game five. The saddest victims, who else but the Cubs? The league championships were still best of five in 1984. The Cubs won the first two from the Padres, the opener 13-0, and then lost game three. Then lost game four on Steve Garvey's homer in the bottom of the ninth. Game five, three two Cubs in the seventh. Then Tim Flannery's roller hops under Paul Durham's dog at first, tied. Then 24-year-old Tony Gwynn plays pinball with Ryan Sandberg. Padres go in front and to the World Series. The 82 Angels blew a two-zip lead to the Brewers, but led the finale 3-2 in the seventh. With left-hander Cecil Cooper coming up, manager Gene Mock did not bring in Southpaw Andy Hassler, sticking instead with righty Louis Sanchez. Coop promptly whacks a two-run single, and Milwaukee goes to the World Series. Happened to the 81 Astros in that year's split-season strike playoff. Jerry Royce shut out Nolan Ryan in the fifth game. The only time in the division series, the Yankees had blown a two-zip lead on the Mariners in 95, but still led the decider by one in the 11th. Instead of going to closer John Wetland, Buck Showalter let Jack McDowell start his third inning of relief. Edgar Martinez will lead the Yankees of any further season. Here comes the tying run, and here comes the winning run. Home teams win game five. Is the crowd at Jake tonight a factor? If you had asked me this a couple years ago, I'd have said no, but in the 97 playoffs, I watched that crowd at the Jake carry this team past the Yankees and the Orioles. They are the best fans in baseball when they have to get loud. All right, only the third game five in the history of the division series is next. Joe Buck and Tim McCarver standing by at the Jake. We'll see you afterwards. Now, please, let it take you out to the ball game. The deciding game between the Boston Red Sox and the Cleveland Indians. And now welcome to the broadcast booth, everyone. I'm Joe Buck, along with my partner, Tim McCarver. Who would have thought when these two teams left this city on Thursday that this series would even think about coming back here for a fifth game? Well, it's a real credit to Jimmy Williams and the Red Sox for the abrupt U-turn they've taken in this series. There's one question that's left. Will the most dominating pitcher in the game, Pedro Martinez, be available to Jimmy Williams tonight? I think the important thing to keep in mind is what it's not. It's not an elbow, and it's not a shoulder. It's a pulled muscle under the right shoulder blade. And what will determine whether Pedro Martinez pitches tonight or not will be whether he can withstand the pain when he throws the ball, because there will be no further damage by pitching tonight. Well, if it's bearable for Pedro Martinez, it might not be bearable for the bats of the Cleveland Indians. Joining us for tonight's telecast is the third member of our broadcast crew. Happy to have him with us. Let's go down to Bob Brenly. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. Both teams went about business as usual today in pregame warm-ups. The Red Sox very professional, very business-like. The Indians very loose and loud. If the Indians needed any added motivation, they figured to get it from the home crowd here at Jacobs Field tonight, much like the Red Sox did last night at Fenway Park. There's a reason these guys play for home field advantage in the postseason. 12 of the last 13 winner-take-all games have been won by the home team, including the last six in a row. All right, Bob, thank you very much. And as we say goodbye for just a moment, get ready for Game 5, the deciding game winner-take-all. Winner get a chance to go to the ALCS to take on the New York Yankees. Game 5, next on Fox. The 1999 Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Infinity, makers of the all-new i30 Performance Luxury Sedan. It's all the best thinking. By Adidas, Long Live Sport. By The Story of Us, starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Bruce Willis, starts Friday, October 15th, rated R. And by MasterCard, MasterCard, proud sponsor of Major League Baseball and fan of the great American pastime. And we welcome you back to Jacobs Field here in Cleveland. 
Fans are packed in as they always are here at Jacobs Field. And for more on the Pedro Martinez story, we send it back down to Bob Brenly. Bob? Well, thank you, Joe. Pedro Martinez in the first base Red Sox dugout is wearing baseball spikes. Pitchers generally wear running shoes to sit on the bench and watch a ball game. Pedro has his spikes on. He's ready to go to that bullpen if necessary. Back to you, Joe. All right, Bob. Already proving his worth here in Cleveland. Bob Brenly with the story that Pedro is in spikes. Keep talking about dancing to Mambo number five. Back at Fenway, it's tough to dance to Mambo number five wearing spikes. <laughs> so no tennis shoes, spikes. We might see him later. Right now we see Charlie Nagy. And we look at the Budweiser starting lineup for the Boston Red Sox. Jose Offerman will lead off at second base. John Valentin has been a hero in games three and four for the Red Sox. He's at third base batting second. Then Brian Daubach, the DH. Nomar Garcia Parra is at short. Troy O'Leary's in left with Mike Stanley at first. Jason Baratek catching. Darren Lewis is in center. And Trot Nixon, the rookie, is in right field batting ninth. We look now at the defense for the Indians. Will Cordero will start in left field. David Justice was penciled in. About an hour and a half ago, he came up with a stiff neck. So Cordero in left, Lofton in center, Ramirez in right. Travis Fryman with a bad knee at third base. Omar Vizquel at shortstop, Roberto Alomar. Those two are the best in the business, or at least as good as the two with the New York Mets. Jim Tomey at first base, Sandy Alomar behind the plate, and Charlie Nagy working on three days rest. He has never worked on three days rest during the regular season. He did, however, pitch in postseason one time on three days rest. Ten in one lifetime against the Red Sox. With an excellent earned run average, that includes 3-0 and in postseason. Having fun with Charlie Nagy, he is a rock and roll pitcher. If he doesn't get rollers, he gets rocked. Refuses to use the middle of the plate for strikes. He'll be working down in the strike zone if he's effective, in and out. And he's improved his velocity. I beg your pardon, as his velocity has decreased with fatigue. So working on the fourth day tonight uh, could be an advantage to Charlie Nagy because he's a sinker ball pitcher and not a power pitcher. And sinker ballers uh, need to be a little weak to keep the ball down. This broadcast also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television. By the way, who didn't have a stiff neck? in the field for the Cleveland Indians in last <laughs> night's game in Boston. Yeah, which a, couldn't replace all of them. With a 23 to 7 <laughs> win for the Red Sox. And this crowd is already going nuts. Maggie ready to work to Offerman with Valentin and Daubach to follow. Game five underway and a one hopper to Vizquel. One down. I have to say, and Tim, you and I were sitting here working on the notes for tonight's game about an hour and a half as Valentin is introduced, about an hour and a half before the game, maybe as recently as an hour ago. This place was just dead quiet. And when they throw the first pitch of the night, this crowd lets these Indians know that they're still behind them despite the fact that they've dropped the last two games to the Red Sox. One out, nobody on, and here's Valentin. And there's ball one outside. Daubach waiting on deck. Nagy took care of the first, and he got a roller. A one hopper to the shortstop, Vizquel. 2-0 and on Valentin. If baseball's a game of peaks and valleys, well, Valentin has been to Everest and Death Valley during this uh, playoff series. Two crucial errors and a dynamic offensive performance, particularly yesterday. Two balls and a strike. Garcia Parra, who sat out game three, got a hit in game four last night, is in the lineup tonight for Jimmy Williams. Two up, two down. Good sign immediately for the Cleveland Indians and their fans. Two ground balls thrown by Charles Nagy. 
And now Dombach, who is one for 11. The one hit a home run in game three, but only one out of 11 in this division series against the Indians. Two out, nobody on. To the right side and through the right side. A base hit for Dombach, which keeps this first inning alive for Garcia Parra. On that ground ball, back to Charles Nagy by John Ballington. You may have noticed uh, this ball hit very well to right field by Brian Dahlbach, but it hit the dirt in front of home plate. That about is about as soft a dirt in front of home plate as you can have, and naturally the Cleveland Indians ground crew has manicured it specifically to Charles Nagy's liking. Now that's Valentin right there. When that when that dust and dirt spreads like that, you know it's soft. Garcia Parra into deep center field at the wall. It is gone. A home run, no more. And a two to nothing Red Sox first inning lead. Game one here at Jacobs Field, a homer in his first at bat. And a two to nothing Boston first inning lead. That home run hit almost in the exact same spot as Garcia hit the ball off of Bartolo Colon in game one last Wednesday night. How soft is the dirt out beyond the wall in center field? <laughs> we go back to game one. Bartolo Colon delivers. Garcia Parra delivers. And you're right. I mean, it, it is almost a carbon copy of what just happened. It was a solo blast to lead off the second inning in game one. And Garcia Parra, with that bad right wrist, sat out game three, as I mentioned, got a hit last night and hits his second homer of this series to put Boston out in front. O'Leary takes one over the outside corner, two and two. You brought up an interesting point, though, Joe. If you hit it above the dirt, you don't have to worry about it, right? Get the dirt. <laughs> Back toward us, still two and two. O'Leary's only two out of 16 in this series. But he led this ball club with 28 home runs, a career high during the regular season. At least two in the first for Brett Saberhagen. Two balls, two strikes, two out. Two runs home for the Red Sox. To the magic number for the Cleveland Indians also. Two pitchers not available tonight. Steve Reed, the right-hander, and Bartolo Colon, who started yesterday's game and threw 44 pitches in his two-plus innings. Another 2-2 pitch to O'Leary. And a full count with Stanley winning on deck. Nomar Garcia Parra, who led the American League with a 357 average during the regular season, puts Boston out in front. Now the 3 2. O'Leary is gone. And the first half inning is history in game five. Damage done. Nomar Garcia Parra, a shot to center field. And with that, the Red Sox in game five have a 2 0 first inning lead. Ted Williams told Nomar Garcia Parr at the All-Star Game, you're the man now with the Red Sox. Well, there is no doubt about it, at least with a bat in his hands. Nomar Garcia Parr is the man for the Red Sox. Tonight, the man on the mound is Brett Saberhagen. And a look at the Budweiser starting lineup for the Cleveland Indians. They lead off with Kenny Lofton in center field. Omar Vizquel batting second at short. Roberto Alomar hitting third at second base. Manny Ramirez, well, it's been a dismal series to this point. 
He is 0 for 15 with Jim Tomey at first base, Harold Baines the DH, Will Cordero, a late addition to this lineup as the left fielder David Justice takes a seat. Travis Fryman's at third base, and Sandy Alomar is catching and batting ninth. The defense of the Red Sox should be familiar to you by now. O'Leary, Lewis, and Nixon in the outfield. Valentin, Garshapara, Offerman, Mike Stanley at first base. Jason Veritek, his manager calls him fearless. He's behind the plate, and he'll catch Brett Saberhagen. Brett Saberhagen pitched the decisive game in the 1985 World Series. He was the Cy Young Award winner that year for the Kansas City Royals and the most valuable player in the World Series. So this is his second decisive postseason game. Still has excellent fastball, can ride the ball or sink it, and to left-handers, very important. There are six left-handed Indians in the lineup. He'll go outside early, inside late. One little, two little, six little left-handed Indians. Lofton is one of them, and he takes a ball outside from Brett Saberhagen. Lofton is two out of 14 in this series, so another threat at the top of the Indians lineup that isn't doing much in this series against Boston. One ball, one strike. This Cal next. Two nothing Red Sox here in the first inning. Saberhagen started game two. He lasted only two and two-thirds innings. Two and one on Lofton. Three fastballs from Saberhagen. And remember that last bullet point on his scouting report. Admittedly, he did not throw enough off-speed pitches in game two. That was the game where he gave up seven runs, walking three in an inning. Highly uncharacteristic for Brett Saberhagen. It was also a day in which the... Indians won 11 to 1 and it looked like it would be three and out for the Red Sox and here we are in game five. Two balls and a strike on Lofton. And now three and one from Saberhagen. Cleveland. You want to invite trouble, that's the way to do it. Walk Lofton leading off. Saber Hagen walking three in one inning. He has only done that six times in his career. Six. And that's over a 15-year period. Here's Vizquel, four out of 16 in this series, two RBIs. Batting in that all-important spot in front of the Thunder in this Indians lineup. Saberhagen, a two-time 20-game winner, two-time Cy Young Award winner. A guy who sat out all of 1996 with shoulder trouble. They had lost and leaning, but... The throw not close, no tag applied. Let's go down to Bob Brentley, Bob. You know, Joe, Kenny Lofton, uh, obviously a base stealer, spent a lot of time with the Cleveland Indians training staff right before the first pitch of this ballgame, stretching out his legs. He should be ready to go. He stays put, and Vizquel drops down a bunt. They'll let it roll, and a wise decision by Veritek as he picks it up foul. And back to first is Lofton. I think Mike Hargrove's arguing that Veritek may have touched this ball, but he went after it. Did he touch it? No. Once you go after it the first time, you can't come back and expect to get it the second time. He goes after it, and now elects to let it roll foul. Mike Hargrove is talking to home plate umpire John Shulak, but clearly that ball was foul. He didn't touch it. And now Jimmy Williams is going to... Walk out to the home plate umpire, John Shulock. And say, look, what's he running out there for? I'm going to come out and have my say. And Shulock at least hears it from Jimmy Williams. And now Jimmy Williams hears it from the crowd here at Jacobs Field. So no one count on Vizquel with a runner at first. Nobody out. Back on that. And you 
can hear first base coach Brian Graham screaming at Lofton to get back. Shulock behind the plate. Erwood Merrill is at first. Jim Joyce at second. Chuck Merriweather over at third. Now Lofton's running. Throwdown by Veritek, not close. Roberto Alomar ran on the first pitch against Pedro Martinez in game one. Kenny Lofton runs on the second pitch against Brett Saberhagen. Bob Brindley alluded to the fact that Lofton was ready, and boy, did he ever show it with that steal. First three guys in the Indian lineup, all burners. Lofton who struggled with a right hamstring problem in July, then a lower back strain. Off and running in the first inning, and now Vizquel hits it fair down the left field line. Lofton will score in the second with a double Vizquel. It's 2-1. to one. Joe Kerrigan, the pitching coach, out to talk to Saberhagen. This ball just fair down the left field line. Third RBI for Vizquel in this series. And if you're thinking about pitching Pedro Martinez, no time like the present to have him warm up. The one thing you don't want to do is bring him in, bring him in when the Red Sox are trailing, either tied or ahead. Well, the tying runs in second with nobody out. Martinez still seated in the dugout. And now you face Alomar, Ramirez, and Tomey. A walk, a steal, an RBI double. And Alomar, who is 6 out of 15 in this series, three RBIs, it's third in this Indians lineup. Hard hit right at Stanley, one away. Good base running by Vizquel. Stays close to second and back to the bag. He's there with one out. Even the out, the first out for Brett Saberhagen is a bad sign. A rocket caught by Mike Stanley. And you're right, it was good base running by Vizquel. The Indians fans wondering if it's right here and now that Manny Ramirez, who drove in 165 runs during the regular season, breaks out of this funk in this division series. games for Ramirez in this postseason 0 for 15 no RBIs had only one four game stretch with no hits and no RBIs this season the 1 0 right down the middle one ball one strike and Saberhagen got it up there at 91 miles per hour Vizquel the tying run. The man at the plate, Manny Ramirez, with those 165 RBIs, more runs batted in than any major leaguer in the past 60 years. Pops it up. Shallow right, easy for Nixon. Two out. And now it takes a hit from Tomey to tie this game. Ramirez now 0 for 16. A perfect pitch to Manny Ramirez. That's what American League pitchers try to do, crowd him. You see how he brings the hands in, hits the ball a little above the trademark, and pops weakly to the right side. Perfect pitch by Saberhagen. 
those are the types of pitches where you want the hitter to put the ball in play and not foul it back. And now a postseason pain in the neck for opposing pitchers. Jim Tomey digs in. 14 career postseason home runs in 49 games. Two homers in this series for Tomey. Ball one. No dancing at the moment for Martinez, just support for the veteran Saberhagen, a 35-year-old right-hander. Pedro caught there in a quasi-sitting position. <laughs> There'll be a lot of that in this ballpark tonight. The 1-0 to Tomey. Two balls, no strikes from Saberhagen. Jim Tomey, who led the league this season in walks and strikeouts. Up on the count, 2-0. Oh. You know what he's thinking. That in the deep right center. Forget it. 3-2 Cleveland. was looking for a changeup on the 2-0 count with first base open. He got it and hit a rocket. My goodness, he hit that ball a long way. The crowd wants to see Tomey again as Saberhagen looks at Baines. There was absolutely zero doubt. Fifteen career postseason home runs for Tomey. Third of this series. Two balls, no strikes on Baines. Two out bases empty, and Baines swings and misses and shoots the bat down toward Mike Stanley. If you think that last home run by Tomey was long, Try this 511-foot home run on July 3rd on Blake Stein of the Kansas City Royals. It is the longest home run measured in the history of Jacobs Field, which has been around since 1994. Joe, that one he just hit wasn't that far behind it. 477 feet. Baines rolls one over to Stanley and a loud first inning is over. Garcia Parra went deep for Boston. Tomey goes deep for Cleveland. What a start to game five. Three-two Indians. What a first inning here in Cleveland and the Indians come out with a 3-2 lead in the second. Stanley leads it off, takes his strike over the outside corner from Nagy. It'll be Stanley, Baratek, and Lewis for the Red Sox, who now trail by one. Mike Stanley has had a terrific series. You saw the average. He is 10 for 16. Between innings, Jimmy Williams and Pedro Martinez talking at one point. I saw Jimmy Williams say to Pedro, maybe he'll settle down. But it is a distinct possibility that Martinez could be pitching here tonight. I think one thing to keep in mind, Joe, is that it's going to take Martinez a long time to loosen up. Normally a pitcher loosens up about 15 minutes before game time. 
but it could take him as much as 20 minutes under the circumstances with the bad muscle pull under the right shoulder blade. Stanley stays alive. And again, you don't want to wait until it's too late when the cat's out of the bag and the Red Sox are behind by too many runs. It's got to be at least, I would think, it's got to be at least a tie game or a Red Sox lead to bring him in. What he did in game one, leaving after four innings as Stanley takes ball one. I know you and I both, and Bob as well, respectfully disagree with Steve Lyons and certainly what he reported do. during the pregame portion of our telecast here tonight. Yep. But there is something more to the problem with Pedro Martinez as Stanley stays alive just getting a piece of that pitch. I think it's within all of us to look for something deeper or something more serious. But there is a legitimate chance that he could pitch here tonight. And if it was a shoulder, Jimmy Williams, for the future of the Red Sox, would not even think about pitching him in this game. Right. Two balls, two strikes on Stanley. Stanley. The number six hitter in this lineup. Strikes out, one away. Staying out of the middle of the plate, teasing Mike Stanley with the breaking ball away. Fine slider from Charles Nagy. When he's in the middle of the plate, as with most pitchers, he is very, very hittable. He's not a hard thrower. He's got to work the corners and keep the ball down to be successful. Now Ferretek pounded a home run in that 23-7 win last night for Boston at Fenway. Takes a ball. He's had a long year, 144 games for the Red Sox during the regular season. And he's been behind the plate in each of these five in this series with the Indians. The series, the bottom of the order for the Red Sox, dismal in the first two games and absolutely on fire in the last two. The 1-1. One -one. Two balls and a strike on Veritek. Now three and one is he wouldn't chase that. Darren Lewis waits to hit next. Up the middle, Alomar to his right. Backhanded stand, and he's got it. Two gone. Second baseman I've ever seen. He adds a new dimension to second base. Range. Yet another example of Alomar's remarkable range at second base, throwing in the same motion. One hops it to Tommy for the second out. And now with two outs and the bases empty, Darren Lewis takes the ball. You could see from up here that the instant that ball left the bat, he knew he was going to make the play. He didn't hurry to get over there. He timed it to where he'd have a true backhanded pickup. And he knew who was running. The catcher fair attack and he got it by half a step. One ball, one strike on Lewis. Five out of 12 in this series, which is a surprise for a guy who was struggling in the final month of the regular season with a sore left wrist. Alomar, another try to his right. Backhanded pickup. He got him. Roberto Alomar. Still 3-2 Indians. The 1999 Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Brewery Fresh Budweiser, official beer of Major League Baseball. This Bud's for you. 
Indians lead by a run. Bottom of the second. Saber Hagen back to the hill, and Will Cordero takes a strike. Cordero is four out of five in this series and was really the only Indian who had a good night last night at Fenway. Hit a home run in the game and that 23-7 loss as he's in the hole now 0-2. Cordero, then Fryman, then Alomar, the bottom three in the lineup for the Indians. Good rip by Cordero, still 0-2. We understand Pedro Martinez has left the dugout. We are tracking his every move. With good reason, as is everybody in New England. As is everybody in the Indians' dugout. 0-2 the count. Cordero first up in the second for the Indians. Cordero, who broke his left wrist on June the 8th. Only in 54 games this year for Cleveland. Takes ball two. Still two and two. Boston Red Sox have been swept out of the playoffs two of the last three years. Go back to 95, they were swept by Cleveland in the division series. Last year losing three games to one. The hands of the Indians tied two games apiece here in game five, and Cordero into left field. Into the corner and off the top of the wall. Well played by O'Leary, and Cordero can manage only a single on a ball that nearly left the park. O'Leary, who's used to playing that green monster in Boston, played that like this was his home ballpark. From a defensive standpoint, the Red Sox are superior. They have a very, very good defensive outfield, as shown right here by Troy O'Leary. One hop off the wall to hold Cordero to a single. The Indians, on the other hand, with Cordero in left and Ramirez in right, are not strong. You have a, a limping Travis Fryman at third base, and Sandy Alomar Jr. behind the plate has only played 37 games. Six operations on that left knee. Fryman gets into one into left field. At the track, O'Leary looks up. They rule it's off the top of the wall. In to score is Cordero. Into second with a double is Fryman. And now we'll get an argument. That ball's got to be out of the ballpark, doesn't it, Joe? It landed softly when it came down. Had it hit the wall, it seems to me that it would, it would have carried back a lot harder. Or did it carry him about a foot above the wall? Get yeah. another look at it on the replay. That ball's gone. That yeah, ball's it, behind the yellow line. Yeah, the, the, what, the way I judged it was the way it came back. It came back in a fluffy fashion it didn't carry him back hard otherwise it's in the left center field well the closest umpire to it is tim welke he went out got a look at it and now he may be overruled by his yeah, fellow it, umpire it, it not only hit the top of the wall but it hit the gate or that rim that goes above the yellow line that ball's a home run the way i see it Get no argument out of me. He came back and it hit the railing. And it's gone. They got the call right. Jimmy Williams is going to argue, but this is the correct call. A home run for Fryman. And it's now a 5-2 Cleveland lead. Jimmy Williams will argue, and his argument will be this. Tim Welke was the closest one to it. And now the... Umpires on the infield and the guy down the right field line are going to overrule him. But the umpires got the call right. 
It went over the yellow line, hit up against that railing which separates the fans from the top of the wall. And the home run for Fryman is his first in the postseason. As you can see, the ball came up and hit that railing, those three bars right above the wall. And by the way it came down, that's a pretty good indication that the ball was out of the ballpark. Jim Joyce, the second base umpire, unusually probably had a better view or at least as good a view as the left field umpire, Tim Wilkie. So a single high off the wall by Cordero, and now a home run that just got over the wall and left off the bat of Fryman, and all of a sudden the Red Sox find themselves down by three. As I mentioned, for Fryman, his first career postseason home run. And now Jimmy Williams out to the mound. He's going to make a pitching change, as he did in last night's game four. Derek Lowe will enter. A pitching change here in the second as the Red Sox had to make in game four. Cleveland up by three. Well, we can debate it. All we want up here in the booth, let's go down to the field, listening to Brian Graham, first base coach of the Indians, and Mike Stanley. was exactly right it hit that bar behind the yellow line Ryman goes deep and it's 5-2 India yeah Joe I think they were both right I think Mike was right it hit the yellow line and then the bar <laughs> that cushiony coming back to the field the 0-2 let's go down to Bob Brentley Bob Well, you know, Joe, a similar exchange on the third base side. Jeff Newman, the third base coach for the Indians, consulting with John Shulock, the home plate umpire, on his way out to consult with Jim Joyce and Tim Welke. By the time Shulock got out there to the consultation, he ruled home run. All right, Bob, so who says these base coaches do nothing? Jeff Newman, who goes through the signs, I would say has a more valuable job than the first base coach, but... First base coaches around Major League Baseball now screaming at their television. One out after Alomar struck out. And we go back to the top of the order. Lofton, who walked, stole a base, and scored a run. And the first inning digs in, and that's strike one. Tim Welke, the left field umpire. That's why you have uh, umpires down the lines in postseason play usually closer to plays on the wall. Jim Joyce, because there was a runner on at first base, was inside the second base line. Now, right, right here, you can see Jim Joyce would have an easier time identifying a home run in that area, but still had a pretty good shot on a ball hit in the air because he was racing toward left center field. Lofton pops it up. Offerman back to get it. And they leave him alone. Two out. Derek Lowe, the right-hander on the mound for the Red Sox, has pitched extremely well in this division series and is making a name for himself. For those in baseball who are watching him work in this postseason, he does have a win and a loss. Two decisions. You see what he did this season with an ERA of 2.63 in 74 games. Also saved 15 games. He's got a nasty, nasty sink to his pitch. Good breaking ball. Get it up there around 90 miles per hour. The one out of his cal is in for a strike. One ball, one strike. Overall in this series, low is one and one with an ERA of 1.42. Only one run in seven innings now. Two balls and a strike on Vizquel. In game one, he came in the game after Pedro Martinez left in the fifth inning. And then in the sixth, with two out and nobody on, Ballantin made the throwing error. Then Jim Tomey had the home run. That was the only hit the Indians 
got off low in that game. A three and one, Vizquel grounds to first. Stanley makes the easy play and the inning is over. But another home run, another two run shot. Travis Fryman goes deep and after two, 5-2 Cleveland. Now, here we go, third inning, and the Red Sox come to the plate. Red Saber hanging on your right is finished. Charles Nagy on your left, formerly on your left, now in the center of your picture, works it in, and Trot Nixon takes his strength. The number nine hitter, then back to Offerman and Valentin. The Red Sox bat trailing by three here in the third inning. strike two it's ball one one ball one strike Joe we talked about that loose dirt in front of home plate Charles Nagy has enticed four ground ball outs and two strikeouts not a fly ball out yet Red Saberhagen on the other hand faced eight Cleveland Indians and in giving up five runs had only one ground ball hit against him two balls one strike Trot Nixon leading off checked his swing Three and one. Did Nixon go too far? Nope. On three and one, Nixon rips it foul. Oh, Watch Sandy Alomar from catcher cam. Get some help. Third base umpire Chuck Merriweather said he did not go around. And now it's full. Three balls, two strikes. Dangerous pitch, and Nixon unloaded. Still three and two. By the way, two strikeouts tonight. Charlie Nagy is now the Indians' all-time postseason strikeout leader with 55 strikeouts. One more than Oral Hershiser. A leadoff walk. That's the first walk handed out by Nagy tonight. The Red Sox left-handed batters, but Charles Nagy has gone through the lineup one time. Particularly in this situation, he'll be throwing sinkers away to Offerman to try to get the double play grounder. So the Red Sox hitters have to start taking him the other way to be successful. Line drives, hard ground balls back through the middle, and pepper the hole between the shortstop and Fryman at third. One on, nobody out. Offerman takes a ball. Another thing they have to do, which is the opposite end of what Mike Hargrove talked to us about, why is Nagy 10 and one lifetime, including the postseason against the Red Sox? They go up there and hack. If they're patient, and they let some of these sinker balls drop out of the strike zone, like Nixon just did, and now Offerman. Runner goes, and a base hit up the middle will send Nixon to third. The Red Sox making some noise now here in the third. A walk, a single, it's first and third with nobody out. Very brazen of Jimmy Williams to put the hit and run on. Three runs down. Open it up, says the normally conservative Williams. You can see the look by Nixon, and once he sees the ground ball go through, goes to third easily. Valentin, who went deep twice in game four last night in Boston, stands in. First and third, nobody out. And a strike. Last night, take you back to the two home runs. Got Bartolo Colon. Then he took care of Parsa. One into the net, one over the net. The 0-1. One. one ball, one strike. All three hitters in this inning took a strike.
first and third, nobody out. Valentin chased, and now he's in the hole, one and two. Nick's in a walk, a hit-and-run single for Offerman. Two and two. That's what that fastball inside did on the first two pitches to Valentin. Two fastballs in, breaking ball away, and now the fastball just misses. Close. Two balls, two strikes. Tying run at the plate for the Red Sox. That's foul. Offerman started and stopped over at first. Talk to Jimmy Williams about this Red Sox team. They tell you individually, you wouldn't think much of this Boston ball club, but as a group, he loves this group that he's managing this season. A lot of heart. Two balls, two strikes on balance, and a check on Offerman. Team concept from individual achievement. That's the Boston Red Sox in 99. And the cover of their media guide in 2000. Yeah, new millennium. Two balls, two strikes. Here's a guy in Valentin who had trouble with the left patella tendon, a tendonitis in that left knee. This time from August 31st, he came back September 23rd, worked his way back in. Got into playing shape. Has been a major factor in this series. Valentin grounds it. Fryman diving stop. Out at second. That's all the Indians will get a run scores. And it's 5-3 here in the third. Fryman, bad knee and all, took a hit away from Valentin. You had bad knees at the corners on this play. Nixon scores. Watch the play by Fryman. Still good hands. Not a lot of range. But as Alomar feels it and uses the bag for protection from the sliding Offerman, Valentine, or Valentin, is diving into first base. Great play by Fryman. But Valentin risking further injury to, the, to that knee, diving into first on the other end. One on, one out, two run game. Daubach takes high for ball one. Dahlbach a base hit with two out in the first inning immediately before the home run hit by Garcia Parra. First pitch, a two-run shot. And the Indians came back with three in the first. Cleveland just got two in the second. Now the Red Sox get one in the third. One ball, one strike on Dahlbach. Oh, you saw Travis Fryman. Here's John Ballington on the other end. Limping down the first baseline and then diving into the bag. Sleep in November, I guess. They don't bother to hold against Valentin, who isn't running well with a left-handed batter at the plate in the 1-1. Two balls, one strike on Daubach. Nomar Garcia Parra waits on deck. Dahlbach pretty well hit into left field. Back is Cordero. At the wall, can't make the catch. Valentin will dig for third and hold there and a double by Dahlbach. And it's second and third with one out. The tying runs on for the Red Sox. So now the Red Sox, you had Offerman going up the middle and now Dahlbach clearly going the other way. We talked about the left field defense of Cordero. Some left fielders would make that play. Guy like David Justice, who has two or three inches on Cordero, but as we mentioned, 
There's going the other way. As we said, you try to pull that ball, it's a 4-6-3 double play. But the Red Sox, the second time through, are adjusting to Nagy. And now this presents with the runners at second and third, one out, first base open. A third inning decision for Nagy and Mike Hargrove. No one warming up in the Indian bullpen. Obviously Yet Troy talking about putting Garcia Parra on here with O'Leary on yeah, deck. Yeah, but uh, with O'Leary on deck, O'Leary driving in 103 runs himself on the year. But Garcia Parra, they have seen enough of this guy, say the Indians. He 11 RBIs in four games last year against Cleveland. He missed the Saturday game and played only half of yesterday's game. But a two-run homer his first time up. And the crowd loves the fact that they're going to walk Garcia Parra. And obviously, if the Indians are in a spot where they can pitch around Nomar and let somebody else beat him, they will. The utmost respect, walking a right-hander to get to a left-hander with over 100 runs driven in. If you're Troy O'Leary right now, you've got to be thinking, Nagy's only going to go away from me. So I've got to do like Dawback did and hit the ball the other way. O'Leary with good power to left field. No sinker ball pitcher will entice a double play by coming inside to a left-hander. He'll stay away. So once again, O'Leary's got to be looking away with Nagy out there, at least on the first couple of pitches. Bases loaded for the Red Sox, who are trailing by two. Third inning. One out. Troy O'Leary struck out his first time. Hits it in the air to deep right center field. Track wall, grand slam, Troy O'Leary. A 7-5 Red Sox lead here in the third inning. They walk Garcia Parra, and Troy O'Leary says, take that. A grand slam, and it's a two-run Red Sox lead. It is rare that you can second-guess a pitch, but when you walk a guy like Garcia Parra and you've got a left-handed hitter up there, you can't throw him an off-speed pitch, not to get the double play. First pitch, a hanging breaking ball to O'Leary. He did not foul it back. He made the Indians pay immediately. Stanley now, who struck out his first time bat, still only one out. A five-run third inning. And seven runs already for the Red Sox, who scored 23 in last night's victory in game four. Two balls, no strikes. Two and one on Stanley. Action for the Indians out in their bullpen. The Red Sox have already, as Jared Wright gets loose, the Red Sox have already relieved their starter. Hard hit the third. Driving plenty of time with Stanley running two out. We talked about it earlier in the game. If Charles Nagy does not throw ground balls, he gets rocked. Kidding about it earlier, serious about it now. You can't really question walking Garcia Parra. That's what you want to do, but you've got to come back with sinkers. You can't throw breaking balls early in the count to a power hitter like O'Leary. Baratek off the end of the bat into left, and Cordero is there to end the inning. It's a five-run third inning for the Red Sox. Playing for a chance to meet their arch rivals, the Yankees in the ALCS after two and a half. Red Sox up by two. Hard to believe with all the postseason action for the Red Sox, but Troy O'Leary is just connected for the first Grand Slam in Red Sox postseason history. Into right center field to give Boston a 7-5 lead. We're now in the bottom of the third inning. And Roberto Alomar 
Takes a ball from Derek Lowe. Alomar, Ramirez, and Tomey. The Indians have the right guys up to get those runs right back. And it's 2-0 from Derek Lowe. A strike from Lowe, and it's 2-1. The Red Sox, who won the World Series in 1903, 1912, 1915, 1916, 1918, but haven't since, 81 years later, are playing for the right to meet the Yankees in the American League Championship Series. Working in a hurry, low on three and one. Runs the count full on Roberto Alomar. Alomar lined out his first time. This time he shoots one into right center field. All the way to the wall. Alomar digs for second and has a leadoff double. <laughs> Only a total of 30 runs scored in last night's game. We're already up to 12 tonight. <laughs> Fastball just rifled into right center field. So many things that Alomar can do on the bases. We've seen his defense back to back plays in the second inning. And now on second base with nobody out. Indians only trailing by two. He'll probably give Ramirez a chance to hit. But he's always a threat to steal third base. And that's what Jimmy Williams is telling Jose Offerman. Holding close at second. Manny Ramirez takes ball one. Sooner or later, Manny Ramirez, who's 0 for 16, will break out. It's much later than this. It may be too late. You can see that right side opening up because Offerman is so close to second base. Ramirez with a good stroke to right, too. The Indians need Ramirez right now. Two balls, no strikes. And now Joe Carrigan, the pitching coach, is going to come out and talk to Derek Lowe. Before the game, my cameras caught the Red Sox lineup in the dugout and checked the third name from the bottom. P. Martinez with an S. It's misspelled. $12 million a year, and you misspell his name. <laughs> They don't, misspell, they don't misspell it on the checks, I guarantee you. Nor did they, nor did that was Grady Little, obviously. Everybody's so excited. It's a, a, an easy mistake. Everybody knows who he is, particularly in a, in a gray road uniform. <laughs> and New England, I might add. Still not in the dugout, not in the bullpen is Pedro Martinez. The 2 0. In the right center field. Ramirez gets his first hit. He knocks home his first run. He has a double, and we have a one-run game. Two old fastball away, and we talked about the stroke of Ramirez to right field. That's what he was doing in batting practice tonight under the tutelage of Charlie Manuel, the hitting instructor. Puts it into effect and inches the Indians closer. Shot of Clarence Jones, former hitting coach for the Braves, as Tommy unloads on strike one. Tommy unloaded in the first inning, a two-run bomb, 477 feet. Into right center field. Breaking ball had Tommy frozen 0-2. Derek Lowe's out there talking to himself after back-to-back -back doubles by Alomar and Ramirez. Red Sox lead by one, tying run in second. Go ahead run at the plate.
two strikes on Jim Tomey. Martinez starts to loosen for the Red Sox. Baines rolls one over to second. Offerman to play. One out. And for any of you who doubted, and I have to admit, I was one of them early, that Pedro Martinez could appear here tonight. Forget about the doubts. There he is getting loose. We're only, again, in the third inning. It's a one-run game. Forget about the doubts and forget about the pull muscle under the back of the right shoulder blade. If Derek Lowe can get through this inning, you may see Pedro Martinez in the fourth. One out, nobody on. Cordero takes a breaking ball for a strike. Pedro Martinez, who tested that back in the shoulder earlier in the day getting loose now and I'm sure at the very least testing the arm in the back to see how it feels on a cool night in Cleveland much more pleasant however than we had in game one here at Jacobs Field Cordero strikes out two gone These two teams absolutely literally pound on one another. The Yankees have to be watching and smiling, knowing that there's Martinez warming up. The Red Sox have pulled their starter Saberhagen after one plus innings. Last night, Bartolo Colon for the Indians couldn't get through two innings. Did throw only 44 pitches. But the top starters, Dave Burba, out with a muscle in his forearm. Injured that in game three, had to leave after four innings. There might not be much left after this series for the ALCS and the defending champion, New York Yankees. 0-2 oh on Freiman. Rod Beck getting loose as well for the Red Sox. Two out, nobody on. Fryman at the plate. He homered his first time up. And he hits it hard to short. Garcia Parra. Boy, he made that look easy. Backhanded pickup, and the inning is over. A double, a double. Another home run from Jim Tomey. Martinez heating up. Jim Tomey already hot. Two tonight. This is first one against Saberhagen. 477 feet. No measurement on this one yet. One thing we do know, it puts the Indians up 8-7. Martinez still loosening as we move to the fourth inning. And there's a ball low and away. One ball, no strikes on Darren Lewis. Lewis tonight is grounded out. Takes a strike, one and one. Already 15 runs tonight combined, 30 runs combined last night, which is a major league postseason record. 45 runs in the last 12 innings played between these two. That's pretty well hit down the left field line into the corner. Cordero gives it a look high off the wall. Another extra base hit. Darren Lewis, a leadoff double. 
Well, it is Monday night. And for those of you watching maybe another sport on another network, welcome to some scoring. You made mention of it. Stop laughing. You look... Stop laughing like Well, the, the Indians went for two. They're leading eight to seven. That's right. I was just going to say. Usually a football team doesn't go for two this early in the game. That's right. <laughs> well, the Cleveland Browns can only hope they would score like this. The Indians trying to maintain. Now they put a graphic over me, so I have to look down. <laughs> I scored 19 of 26 NFL teams. 23 runs scored. There you go. That's, that's prep. It's all about preparation. Well, Mike Hargrove making a, a trip to the mound right now, and that could be all for Charles Nagy. One thing to keep in mind, I think if Jimmy Williams brings Pedro Martinez into the game, he will not bring him in during an inning. He hasn't come in during an inning since 1994 when he was with the Dodgers. So Nagy's out of there, and we'll see who's going to replace him. We'll see if Pedro's going to be the pitcher in the bottom of the fourth. Well, Charles Nagy has finished 10 and one lifetime against the Red Sox. You'd never know it. Pitching on three days rest, but he can't go four. Allows seven earned runs on six hits. And he leaves in favor of a rookie right-hander, Sean DePaula, who started this season at single A Kinston. only appeared in 11 games during the regular season for the Indians. Pitches with a tying run in second. The go-ahead run at the plate. Nobody out here in the fourth inning. And Trot Nixon, strike one. DePaulo was good in last night's game. Really the only Indian pitcher who can stake that claim. An inning in two-thirds, no runs, no hits, three strikeouts. And those are his numbers from the regular season. Trot Nixon walked and scored in his only plate appearance so far. See that DePaula throws hard, 94 miles per hour, one ball, one strike. The 1-1. One, one. Into center field, that's well hit. Lofton back at the track, at the wall, and caught. And Lewis was caught between second and third, scampered back to the bag, and he's still at second one out. A very poor base running play by a good base runner. When you're in that position where you don't know whether the outfielder's going to catch up to it, you go a third of the way. That gives you a chance to get back to the bag to tag and go to third. too far there's nobody out it's imperative that he get to third base it's a bad base running play by Darren Lewis and the thinking behind it is if he doesn't catch it he scores easily absolutely because the ball's off the wall it's rattling around in regular center field and Lofton can't get to it in time at the very worst you have first and third and nobody out now it's a runner at second one out and Offerman drag bunch foul off to the right Let's go down to Bob Brentley. Well, Joe, when Derek Lowe came off the mound at the end of the bottom of the third inning, he was looking at what appeared to be a blister on his hand. He went into the Red Sox clubhouse, stayed there throughout most of this inning. When he came up the tunnel from the clubhouse, he was met by pitching coach Joe Kerrigan, who had some words with him. Lowe grabbed his glove and went back into the clubhouse. As Pedro continues to throw in that bullpen, we can only speculate that perhaps he's coming into this game. Bob, thank you. Look at Joe Kerrigan. We mentioned he's been with Pedro Martinez their years in Montreal, 94, 95, 96, together there, together with the Red Sox. Runner at second, one out, and one ball, one strike on Offerman. A long inning for the Indians in the bottom of the third. A long inning here in the top of the fourth for the Red Sox. What this delay has given Martinez is a chance to warm up like a starting pitcher. Tying run in second, Offerman fouls it away, strike two. Pedro Martinez now with a jacket on. As this crowd comes alive on a one-two pitch coming to Offerman.
Two and two. Valentin, one of the hitting heroes for the Red Sox in this series on deck. Sandy Alomar, that ball eludes uh, a lot of catchers. Keep in mind, we talked about it earlier, Alomar with six operations on that left knee, one of them this year in May. Three balls, two strikes. And Offerman wants time. John DePaula basically came out of nowhere down the stretch for the Indians and pitched so well that he was forced into this bullpen for the postseason for Cleveland. And he misses inside to put the go-ahead run on. Now Lewis is caught between second and third. The throw now gets away. Lewis will head to third, and it's runners at the corners with one out. Darren Lewis fell asleep. On the walk to Offerman, evidently thought he was forced over to third, started to walk over there. Finally realized that for the moment he was the only one on base. Scampered back and the throw goes into center. An error on Alomar to put the tying run at third. When Willie Shakes wrote Comedy of Errors, he didn't think he was writing about this game. There have been some ugly moments oh, in this series. Oh, man. This, this is just, this is, this is Little League baseball right here. They had him by 15 feet at second base. First, Lewis wanders off thinking it's a force play. This is after the ball four. He thinks it's a force and then is caught in between. And now by the time he gets back, the ball's overthrown and he goes to third base. I don't believe it. Now runners at the corners, one out for Valentin. So in the end, Lewis is standing in third with one out. <laughs> Just as he planned it, right? Absolutely. Oh, man. A 1-0 pitch. High from DePaula, 2-0. What happens uh, from a catcher's standpoint, you are so startled, you can't believe he's doing it. Alomar waiting a little bit too long. He had seven errors during the season. This is Sandy's first during the postseason. Man. This is Phil Regan out to talk to his young right-hander. What a spot for a guy who started the season in single A. Here he is in game five, <laughs> helping to decide whether the heavily favored Indians will make it to the next round to face the Yankees. They call it a meteoric rise. I've always found that funny since a meteor falls and doesn't rise. Mr. Carlin, the car is waiting. First and third, one out, two balls, no strikes. And why do they have locks on the doors at 7-Eleven, right? <laughs> They're open 24 hours. Two balls, no strikes. Valentin takes ball three, three and oh. Since the fifth inning of game three, 39 runs, 40 hits, and just over 15 innings. Lewis over at third. Going ahead run is Offerman at first with one out. Is Valentin swinging on 3-0? and oh? Yes. And he gets into one to left. Cordero makes the catch. Tagging and scoring is Lewis. Back to first is Offerman. And it's an 8-8 game here in the fourth. Two base running mistakes and Three minutes later, he scores the tying run. What an adventure around the bases for Darren Lewis. He should have been on third on the deep fly by Nixon. He thinks he's forced, and now he's forced to come home after tagging at third. Finally, Darren crosses home. <laughs> So relax now in the dugout as Daubach pops it up. 
Left side for Cordero. That'll end the top of the fourth inning. This long odyssey continues here in game five. Here comes Pedro Martinez. It is a tie game, Tim. 8-8, bottom of the fourth. Pedro Martinez will be under the watchful, scrutinizing eye of Joe Kerrigan as he works here in the bottom of the fourth inning. Look at that, Joe. They changed the S to a Z. Finally, they got it right. I guess Pedro had to, had to go out there and show him the name on his back. <laughs> it is Pedro Martinez with a Z. And with those numbers, everybody in baseball is well aware of who he is. A 2.07 ERA. And we look at the radar gun, 91 miles per hour. This is Sandy Alomar, Jr. The number nine hitter to lead off in the fourth inning of an 8-8 game, game five of this division series. Crowd chanting Pedro as he falls behind 2-0. A breaking ball right down the middle. Just watching him warm up, I have not heard from Bob. I couldn't talk to him between innings, but Bob... It looks to me like he's dropping down and not throwing over the top like he normally does. He's throwing very low three quarters, Tim. And has mixed in a couple of breaking balls already early in the count. Pedro does not seem to have his good fastball, and his arm angle is not what we're used to seeing from Pedro Martinez. No. Bothered by a pulled muscle in his back under the right shoulder blade. The 2-2 pitch to Alomar leading off. To the shortstop, Garcia Parra. Plenty of time. One away. That looks like the changeup right there to Sandy Alomar. The one thing, however, that the Cleveland Indians, the best lineup in baseball, and they will adjust. If Pedro Martinez does not have the good fastball, then it stands to reason his changeup's not going to be as good, even though he gets Alomar for the first out here in the fourth. Put that changeup in a pretty good spot. Yes, he did. Now with one out, nobody on. Here's Lofton, who's popped up, walked, stolen a base, and scored. 8-8 eight, eight in the fourth. Lofton checked his swing, ball one. He had to pop on that fastball. He was on top of it, and it rode in on the hands of Kenny Lofton. Good spot for that pitch, and Lofton now in the hole, one and two. In his career against the Indians, an ERA of under two. One and oh in the postseason. That was game one of his division series a year ago. Checked it, two and two. Kenny Lofton held up. Hard hit, Stanley, a diving stop. Has to beat Martinez, got him, two goals. Lofton may have had that left hand stepped on. Pedro Martinez looked back immediately, and Martinez could have brought his spike down in the left hand of Kenny Lofton. We talk about how dangerous it is to dive into any bag, but particularly first base and home plate. Very close play, great play by Mike Stanley. Did Martinez step on his hand? The left hand, right foot. I don't think so. I think he jammed that left hand. And also, Kenny Lofton has been nursing a sore hamstring the second half of the season. But a fine play by Mike Stanley. And Martinez finishes it. And he was out. Came in hard to the bag and drove that left hand into the base and then skipped across. 
don't know. He might have stepped on it after the fact. Maybe. Yep. See if we can follow this play. They got the call right. And maybe at the end, Martinez stepped on it, but often certainly went in hot and hard on that bag. You could jam a shoulder, you could jam a knee. All sorts of things can happen when a base runner dives into a bag like that. And it's interesting to note that most of the time you don't get there any faster, not on a force play. Maybe right there, Joe, I think you're right. It's like he curled those left fingers under, but it looked, looks to me that uh, the shoulder or the left elbow, if it's the elbow and or shoulder, and he throws left-handed, keep in mind. Hmm. Good call by first base umpire Derwood Merrill. He was out by about the length of an index finger. And I think you can put aside the worries about the hand. I think you're right. It's shoulder or elbow when he came down near the first base bag and then skipped across it as that left arm kind of gave out. He's the second out of the inning. And we'll let you listen in as... The first base coach, Brian Graham, has this to say. I'm out. I'm out. No, it's okay. You all right? No. All right, lay there. Just stay there. Help's coming. It's left. I got it. The shoulder got to be. The shoulder. No, the shoulder. His left shoulder. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> Martinez will give him a pat on the backside. And out of sheer effort and hustle, Kenny Lofton jams that left shoulder. Who knows the extent of that injury, but the way he's walking off in considerable amount of pain. Two out here in the inning. You'd have to believe the Indians have lost their leadoff hitter for some period of time. Not only lost their leadoff hitter, they've lost their best defensive outfielder in the same breath. So this will certainly weaken the Indians' defensive outfield. Two out, nobody on. Back to baseball, and Pedro Martinez faces Omar Vizquel and misses with ball one. Bob Friendly will get a report for us. One ball, one strike for Martinez. Haven't seen anything harder than 91 miles per hour from Pedro. Normally 95 to 97 with that fastball. Broken bat fly ball to the right side and caught by Stanley to end the inning. So Pedro Martinez does indeed come in and pitch. He has a one, two, three, fourth inning. While they look at Lofton, we'll take a break. Fifth inning when we come back. Welcome back to Jacobs Field here in Cleveland. One of America's most enduring corporate images. The Goodyear blimp is floating overhead, providing these aerial views for tonight's game. The Spirit of Akron. One of seven airships in the Goodyear blimp fleet. Goodyear now has two blimps in Europe, one in South America, one in Australia, and three here in the U.S. Garcia Parra trying to hold up. The call that got it past him, strike one. We're underway in the fifth inning of an 8-8 game. Game five of this division series between Boston and Cleveland. Two quick strikes on Garcia Parra. He's homer tonight, been intentionally walked scored two runs. As lethal as Garciaparra is on that fastball, no need to set him up. Stick with the breaking ball.
Welcome back to Jenkins Field here in Cleveland. One of America's most enduring corporate images. The Goodyear blimp is floating overhead, providing these aerial views for tonight's game. The Spirit of Akron, one of seven airships in the Goodyear blimp fleet. Goodyear now has two blimps in Europe, one in South America, one in Australia, and three here in the U.S. Garcia Parra trying to hold up. The ball got it past him, strike one. We're underway in the fifth inning of an 8-8 game. Game five of this division series between Boston and Cleveland. Two quick strikes on Garcia Parra. He's homer tonight, been intentionally walked, scored two runs. As lethal as Garcia Parra is on that fastball, no need to set him up. Stick with the breaking ball. Friends at NBC will bring you game one tomorrow of the National League Championship Series between the New York Mets and the Atlanta Braves at 8 Eastern. Bob Costas, Joe Morgan, Jim Gray, and then Wednesday night, we will bring you game one of either the Red Sox or Indians at the Yankees. Congratulations to the New York Mets and the Atlanta Braves as they move on. Final two left in the National League. Is called at the plate, no pitch. Nothing and one on O'Leary, and Dave Roberts is now in center field for the injured Kenny Lofton. One out, nobody on. O'Leary chops to second. Alomar, the other hand toss, two gone. about a disparity in pitchers in the game right now in the decisive game of this best three out of five series. DePaula not only making the minimum, but making the minimum Major League salary for a month. For a month. Facing Pedro Martinez, one of the highest paid players in baseball. Making the Fortune 500 minimum. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Man. Two balls, no strikes on Stanley. Stanley 0 for 2, takes a rip, 2 and 1. Center fielder Dave Roberts, by the way. 27 year old outfielder for Mike Cargrove. Getting his first big league action this year, and here he is in game five of the division series. Two and two. The Red Sox threaten to go in order for just the second time tonight. They won't. A two-out walk. That's the fourth walk handed to the Red Sox this evening. And here is Jason Veritek, who homered last night in Boston. Hit 20 on the regular season, is 0 for 2 tonight. The term go in order may be the strangest term this game could offer. <laughs> Nothing has gone in order. No. On the bases, at the plate, on the mound. What are you looking at? <laughs> One on, two out, Veritek.
punt the corner, two and one. Go ahead, run it first with two out here in the fifth. Two and two. Good pitching by DePaula there after the fastball on the outside corner. He came back with a slider on the inside corner. We're only one out away from the halfway point of this game five, but seemingly a mile from the finish line. Still two and two on Veritech. Veritech waiting for a rookie mistake. Martinez back to work, bottom of the fifth inning, game five, tied at eight. The 1999 Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Ameritrade. Believe in yourself. By KFC, home of the new tender roast sandwich. At KFC, we do chicken right in a bucket and now on a bun. By Gateway, Gateway speaks to 50,000 people a day. Connect with us. And by Advil, nothing you can buy is proven to work better. What a night here in Cleveland, Jacobs Field, bottom of the fifth inning, an 8-8 game. Let's take you back down to Bob Brentley. Bob. Yeah, Joe, Kenny Lofton uh, obviously injured his left shoulder very badly. Jim Warfield, the Indians trainer, said the team physician is looking at him right now. They're more than likely going to take him for x-rays and more examination. I'm going to try to make my way down to the Indians clubhouse to see if I can get a further report. Thank you, Bob. First pitch is low and away to Roberto Alomar. We go back to the injury suffered by Kenny Lofton last inning. First slide at first base. As Alomar takes a strike. One ball, one strike. And Lofton is lost for the rest of the night. Who knows how long. Alomar, Ramirez, and Tommy. Part of the order for the Indians. Strike two on Roberto. Two strikes. Full count. Pedro Martinez will throw any pitch on any count. You cannot guess fastball 3-2 with Martinez out there. To the shortstop, Garcia Parra, one away. 3-2 breaking ball from the right-hander, Martinez. That's exactly right, Joe. The breaking ball on the outside part. He may not be throwing as hard, but his unpredictability is the same. Breaking ball, and Alomar rounds out weakly to shortstop. Four in a row retired by Pedro Martinez. Manny Ramirez stands in. Finally broke through with an RBI double his last time up. Later a run scored on another home run by Tommy. 0-1 from Martinez.
there's Martinez. Young Pedro on the left, older brother Ramon on the right. Outside. Two and one on Ramirez. Ramon Martinez, by the way, he started Saturday's game, and he is available tonight if Jimmy Williams needs it. The 2-1. That got away and went behind Ramirez. Crowd doesn't like it, but he's obviously not throwing at him. <laughs> Ball almost hit the bat. First, it almost hit the left shoulder of Ramirez and then almost hit Manny's back. The 3-1, right down the middle with a 91 mile per hour fastball, full count. Well, it's unpredictability, that's what it does. It freezes hitters on hitters' counts. Normally a fastball is ripping, but you're so surprised when you get one. Derek Lowe, 431 feet. 900 feet of homers tonight for Tommy. And 16 in his postseason history. And on the hands, and Tommy had the hair taken off his knuckles. One ball, no strike. I loved his reply to you. When you ask him about his good friend Mark Clark tonight, pitcher for the Rangers, out most of the second half, said, when are you going hunting with Clarkie? He said, I hope early November. <laughs> one ball, no strikes, one on one out. 2-0 oh on Tomey. Now with the 16 home runs, Jim Tomey has moved ahead of Babe Ruth, albeit in more games and in earlier postseason series. Tommy has the division series, the LCS with which to work. Ruth 15, World Series home run. After a walk to Ramirez, it's 3-0 on Tommy. Ruth played in 41 postseason games in his career. Tommy is playing in his 50th here tonight. Will he be swinging right here 3-0? I'd have to think so. If he's not, nobody is. <laughs> the 3-0. He took it for a strike, 3-1. And, and that was the first time, at least, that I bothered to look where Pedro Martinez approached the mid-90s, 93 with that fastball. send Manny Ramirez here. Jim Tomey struck out 171 times this year. Strikeout pitcher against a strikeout hitter. Not a good formula for running. Surprised that they're holding him on. Me too. Three two pitches fouled back. I think Baratek didn't think that Tomey fouled the ball. He's out. He did. What is Ramirez doing? What's Tommy doing? Well, Tommy can't run because sure. first base is occupied with less than two outs. But what's Ramirez doing? Tommy thought he fouled the ball back. Veritek knew he didn't. And Manny Ramirez didn't know what to do. Ramirez took for granted that it was a foul ball. Tommy stood there with first base occupied, less than two out, can't run to first. And he clearly swung through it. Veritek missed it. If you're the runner at first base and you see the catcher going after the ball like that, you know he missed the ball. Veritek doesn't need to touch Tommy. Tommy's automatically out. But what is Manny Ramirez doing? 
And for that matter, Brian Graham, the first base That's coach. Right. Bain, strike one. Brian Graham stood there with his palms to the sky. And Manny Ramirez, who has had a history of problems on the bases, although those have been curtailed for the most part, is standing at first, the go-ahead run, with two out in the inning instead of down at second on the strikeout by Tomey. You can say that you thought Tomey fouled the ball, but the minute you see Veritek running as hard as he was after the ball, you take off for second. If it's a foul ball, they bring you back. All in one the count, runner at first with two out. One ball, one strike on Bain. So in an effort to sell the umpire, Tommy stood there. When I was making the comment, what's he doing? No help from home plate. Mm -hmm. As those down at first were standing and watching instead of Ramirez running. We go the, back. If you're the runner on at first base, this is your key. When Veritek takes off for the ball, what other reason is he running hard for the ball? And Ramirez is standing at first base. Veritek once again needlessly touches Tommy, but the Indians could have the go-ahead run in scoring position instead of a 90 feet closer to home the other way. Go ahead run at first with two out of ball and two strikes on Bain. And here's another situation. Baines at the plate, a left-handed batter. Ramirez, who stole two bases all year. Has yet to steal one this postseason, but they hold against the runner and open up the right side of the infield. One ball, two strikes. Baines took strike three right down the middle. And Pedro Martinez has now thrown two scoreless innings here in game five. We're through inning number five. Sixth inning now in an 8 8 game. The 1999 Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Visa. It's everywhere you want to be. Jacobs Field down below and Action Central 8-8 eight, eight after five. Sixth inning now and Darren Lewis leads off and takes a strike poured in from DePaula. Lewis is doubled and after a wild series of base running mistakes eventually scored the tying run in the fourth inning on a sack fly by Valentin. The 0-1. balls and a strike on Lewis. What you have to do against Aaron Lewis is you sandwich the right side of the field. The second baseman plays deep. The right fielder plays shallow. First baseman deep to try to cut off that little area in right field. That's where Lewis usually hits the ball. As a matter of fact, three of the six hits that he has in this series have been in that little area behind Alomar and in front of Ramirez. As you look at Paul Shuey warming for the Indians. Three balls and a strike on Lewis. The number eight hitter leading off. Full count. Trot Nixon, who has been a weapon for these Red Sox in this series, with six RBIs, waits on deck. That is to the right side, popped up for Alomar. A Kenny Lofton injury report back down to Bob Renly. Yeah, Kenny Lofton indeed suffered a dislocated left shoulder. Our trainer Paul Spacuza is en route right now to a local hospital for further x-rays and tests, but Kenny Lofton with a dislocated left shoulder on this play at first base. Oh, It's uglier every time you look at it. Sure does. It. And now with one out, nobody on, Trot Nixon stands in. Rookie right-hander DePaula giving the Indians valuable outs here in the middle of the game. Keep this in mind. The Indians will use their closer, Mike Jackson, for two innings tonight, if necessary. All in one to count. One and one on Nixon. 
Trout has walked and scored and fly to center. 15 home runs during his first full season in the big leagues. One strike on Trot Nixon. And out three and one as John Shulock does not give to Paul in the inside corner. Joe, I think your point a couple of innings ago was well taken. And that regardless of who wins tonight, the torn and tattered remnants of pitching staffs are going to show up at Yankee Stadium on Wednesday night. Nixon pops it into center. Roberts waiting for it. Place of the injured Lofton. Two out. Friday, catch the most original police drama in years on the series premiere of Ryan Caulfield, year one. And the creator of the X-Files brings you the ultimate mind game, Harsh Realm. It all starts Friday at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, here on Fox. Friday night, two out bases empty for Jose Offerman. He's grounded out, single walk. Strike one. One ball, one strike. If Tapala continues to pitch well and the Indians go on to beat the Red Sox tonight, you may be looking at the game two starter for Cleveland on Thursday. Two balls and a strike at this point. Nobody has any idea if, when the next round rolls in on Wednesday night, who would start for either team. No. No clue. Offerman pops it up. What a job by the rookie, Sean DePaula. His kill, inning over. For just the second time tonight, the Red Sox go one, two, three. Bottom of the sixth inning. Still tied at eight. Welcome back, Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, Bob Brentley, our producer Mike Weissman, director Bill Webb. Our game summary at this point, Tommy, two home runs, four RBIs, now third in the all-time list, postseason home runs. O'Leary, by far the single biggest swing of the night, a four-run swing and a grand slam. He hit after an intentional walk to Garcia Parra in the third inning. The bottom of the game summary was the report on Kenny Lofton, who will spend the night at Lutheran Hospital. Dislocated shoulder, they popped his shoulder back in, and he will be obviously reevaluated tomorrow. Martinez back to the hill. Nothing and one to count on Will Cordero, and now Will backs out wisely. Pedro Martinez continued to bring it to the plate. Actually, no timeout was granted, so it's a one-ball, one-strike count. DePaul is finished for the night. I would argue this if I'm Jimmy Williams. I, to me, Cordero steps out. Home plate umpire John Shulock says that he did not call time in time, and the pitch was ruled a ball when Martinez gave up throwing the ball to home. So it's a 1-1 one -one count instead of 0-1, and, and now a strike to make it 1-2. So again on that second pitch, Cordero stepped out as if he had time. He wasn't granted time, so the pitch counted. And now the count one and two. Fryman and Alomar will follow. Two and two. Nobody knows Martinez better than Will Cordero. He played behind Martinez for three years with Montreal as a shortstop. Doesn't know him well enough. Swing and a miss. <laughs> Goodbye. That's three consecutive strikeouts for Pedro Martinez. And out number one here in the sixth inning. It brings in Travis Fryman, who back in the second inning hit a disputed home run into left. Originally ruled that it stayed in play. Eventually the umpires got it right. It hit the yellow line. Kicked out of play. Hit against that railing which separates the fans from the top of the wall and then back onto the field of play. His first career postseason home run. Takes a ball. One out of two tonight. 
Breaking ball for a strike. Change up for strike two. There is such violence in that change up that Martinez throws. It's the same arm motion as the fastball. One ball, two strikes, and on a change up, a fly ball into right center for Lewis. Two gone. Martinez shook his head no five times. How many pitches does he have? He's one of the few guys who can shake off a catcher and still throw the changeup. That's how deceptive the pitch is. This is not a real good one. It's left up and out over the plate. But a lazy fly ball by Fryman. So now with two out, nobody on. Sandy Alomar Jr. stands in 0 for 2. The number 9 hitter. And a ball in the dirt. Well, if you're just joining us here at Jacobs Field, at the half, Monday Night Football, the Jaguars lead the Jets 10-3. Here is an 8-8 game. Red Sox got out in front, a two-run home run by Garcia Parra. In the first inning, the Indians came back with three in the first cap. On a two-run home run by Tomey, one of two on the night. Troy O'Leary, a grand slam for the Red Sox tonight. And you are watching Game 5, the decisive Game 5 of this division series. And the winner of this game will move on Wednesday night, play at Yankee Stadium and take on the world champions, the start of the American League Championship Series. Two balls and a strike on Alomar. Three and one. In case you're just joining us, Pedro Martinez did not start this game. Brett Saberhagen did. Pitched into the second. Derek Lowe picked up for him, went two, and now Pedro Martinez is working in his third inning of relief. Had to leave after four innings in game one with a pulled muscle in his back. He's healthy enough to pitch and pitching well. One on, two out for Dave Roberts. First at bat in this game, second of the series, and he takes the ball. Paul Shuey warming up the Indians. You hear it a lot when the National League plays that you clear the pitcher. That walk to Sandy Alomar will at least clear Dave Roberts so that Vizquel can lead off in the bottom of the seventh inning. Of course, you don't know what Roberts is going to do, but clearly right now he's the weakest hitter in the Indian lineup. for a guy who has been in the minor leagues up until this year when he had some work with the Indians. 27-year-old outfielder is at a distinct disadvantage facing Pedro Martinez. One on, two out. A fastball misses for ball two. A 92-mile-an-hour fastball. He's reached 95 a couple of times, as you pointed out, Joe. But there's still enough of the disparity between the changeup and the fastball for him to be effective. Now Alomar, and keep this in mind, he's had six operations on his left knee. He's making Pedro Martinez wait on the mound, and I think this is tactical. Pop, perhaps. By Sandy yeah, Alomar. Perhaps. He's untied and tied his left shoe. <laughs> and he looks out at Martinez and smiles. He was making Martinez wait as he fell behind the rookie Roberts two and one. Now three and one with Vizquel next. That's a bad pitch right there. It's okay to throw breaking balls and change ups behind the guy, but if there's anybody you can challenge, it's the center fielder that replaced Lofton.
Unloads on a 93 mile per hour bench full count. And Alomar, who drew this glance from Pedro Martinez earlier. <laughs> oh, Joe, that was great. You picked up on that. That was super. He said, nah, forget all that stuff. Alomar will be off and running with his pitch. Who do you think you're dealing with, right? The best in the business right now, Pedro Martinez, the 3 2 to Roberts. Do it again. And that's what Martinez has to do again. Throw the fastball. Time to finesse, time to challenge right now is if you can hit my fastball, I don't care how hard it is, 89, 90, 91, 92, 95, you're going to have to hit it. 55 pitches so far for Martinez. Runner goes, 3-2, inning over. Pedro Martinez, his fourth strikeout as he hits 94 miles per hour. Still tied after six. Back to Jacobs Field after this from your local Fox station. Over the past 75 years, millions have watched the Goodyear blimps hovering over special events. Tonight, it's the spirit of Akron carrying on that proud Goodyear tradition. You can find out more about the Goodyear blimp fleet on the internet at www.goodyear.com. Paul Shuey, another hard-throwing right-hander, takes over an 8-5 record during the regular season, six saves. Another guy who can bring it to take over for Sean DePaula. A strike is into Valentin. Valentin, Daubach, and Garcia Parra. Anybody gets on O'Leary, who has a grand slam tonight. It's an 8-8 game, seventh inning. Back up the middle, Shuey knocks it down, kicks it away, and Valentin's on to start the inning. You see a lot of things worked on by a lot of ball clubs in spring training. The one thing that should be worked on by Cleveland pitchers is anything hit back to you. If you can't glove it, forget it. You got two guys behind you with unbelievable range. And you're right, Joe. He slapped the ball with his hand and then kicked it with his right foot. Vizquel, had he been able to feel that ball, could have walked it over the first to get Valentin. If Shuey were a hockey goalie on that play, it would have been a goal. So it dribbles away from the mound, and the leadoff man is on. It's a base hit for Valentin, and Dawbach stands in. Two out of three. Ball one. Seventh inning of game five. Series tied at two games apiece, game tied at eight apiece. And we've been tied at eight since the top of the fourth inning. A mid-game battle between rookie Sean DePaula and veteran Pedro Martinez. Dalmont, strike one. Valentin took off anyway in case Dalbach missed it. I'm sure Manny Ramirez is paying attention out in right. Thinking bunt right here, we'll forget about it. If you bunt the, if you bunt Valentin over to second base, and that's obviously the reason Jimmy Williams, not only that you have a power hitter up there, you're gonna walk Garcia Power anyway. Give your best hitter, far and away your best hitter, every chance to hit. Chased it 97 miles per hour from Shuey, strike two. An eye high fastball. If you put that ball in play, you're only going to pop it up or foul it back. Pretty good rip by Dabak as Valentin faked. Made a bluff over at first as if he was going to run. Garcia Parra waits to bat next. for the out. The put out 4-3 down to second to go ahead run. Valentin one away. Let's talk about range again for a second baseman. 
He's gone to his right twice tonight and now to his left. And watch the backhanded flip to Tomey. Earlier, backhanded, a ball hit by Jason Baratek going deep. And to end the inning, he goes shallow for the speedier Lewis to get Darren on a play. He's all over the place. You don't even need a first baseman with him on the right side. <laughs> just to catch his throw. Yeah, just to catch his throw. That's the only reason. Now time called, and we'll have another decision to be made. Do you walk Garcia Parra? They tried this two at-bats ago for Nomar. They intentionally walked Garcia Parra and Troy O'Leary. Bombed a grand slam into right center field. There's more reason to walk him now than there was earlier, in my view. Earlier, you had the tying run on second base, a run that would put you one behind on third, and O'Leary up with a slower pitcher in Charles Nagy. The thing about Shuey is he can get the ball up there, as you said, 97 miles an hour. So you're dealing with a different pitcher. To me, it's clear cut to put him on now, where as it wasn't earlier, but I don't think they're going to do that. They will pitch to Garcia Parra. Go ahead, run at second, one out. And a ball. What often happens, if you try to pitch around a, a runner, well, they're going to walk him now. Why not walk him to begin with? You take one chance, that might be the pitch that Garciaparra pumps. What a goofy game this is. Man. The pitch out from catcher cam. You see how much taller Sandy Alomar is than Omar Garciaparra. level for Alomar is over the head of Garcia Parra who takes his second intentional walk of the night. It brings in Troy O'Leary. Back in the third inning, intentional walk to Garcia Parra and a grand slam, the first in the history of the Red Sox in the postseason. At the time, it gave Boston a two-run lead. That was on a lazy breaking ball, Joe. I think you'll get fastballs away here. Into right field, well hit. Ramirez at the net. Goodbye. Three-run home run, Troy O'Leary. Seven RBIs on the night. His second home run. And with that, the Red Sox take an 11-8 lead. make 45,000 people deadly, eerily quiet. They were happy when Garcia Parra was walked in the third inning, stunned by the grand slam by O'Leary. Happy with the intentional walk here in the seventh inning. Stunned again by O'Leary. It looked like a fastball from Shuey right down the pipe, but not for long. And after Valentin drove in seven last night, O'Leary knocks home seven in game five. Man, what a night for Troy O'Leary, who had a breakthrough season with the Red Sox. From catcher cam, a ball that Alomar never caught. One out, nobody on, and Stanley strikes out, two away. So now with two out, nobody on, Jason Baratek, who's hitless tonight, Rips one right at Tomey, who makes a terrific catch to end the inning. Well, who knows? We may look back on that swing by O'Leary and see the Red Sox roll to the American League Championship Series on that one. Bottom of the seventh inning, time to stretch. 11-8 Boston. 
One for the books. Record set this series. 78 runs combined in this division series. And we're still going. The Red Sox in game four. 23 runs a record. 24 hits a record. 11 extra base hits. Game four. 30 runs combined. Tonight, 19. Valentin, seven RBIs last night. O'Leary, seven driven in tonight in game five for the Red Sox. What a night for Troy O'Leary. Mrs. O'Leary's cow didn't do this much damage. <laughs> One ball, no strikes. And the bunt to third, right at Valentin. John makes the throw on the run for the out. One away. You talked about Pedro Martinez. He'll throw any pitch on any count. Here it is, right from his mouth to your ears. Any count, I'm not afraid, because uh, well, the worst that could happen is I lose the game. And I've done that before. So I, I'm just, an, I'm not very exciting people. I, I'm a very exciting person in my Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not very exciting. No. no, 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 no. We only tracked him for the first three innings of this game, and he wasn't even out there. <laughs> We had more shots of Pedro Martinez than Saberhagen or Derek Lowe combined. One out, nobody on. And a ball down and in after a strike to Roberto Alomar. One ball, one strike. The most exciting. The most dominant, for sure. On the mound in today's game. And I talk about baseball in 1999. Strike two on Alomar as Martinez starts to heat up now. And Roberto, who's one for three, is backed up. One ball, two strikes. If there is any offense which can overcome this deficit, three runs in the late innings, I don't care who's on the mound. It's Mike Hargrove's Indians, who scored 1,009 runs during the regular season. strikes out and that's now five strikeouts for Pedro Martinez I know some folks uh, may be thinking and thinking correctly if he's throwing this well why didn't he start the game as he strikes out Alomar with a good breaking ball and I think Jimmy Williams feeling was that he was going to play for the first time uh, in his career with Martinez a wait and see game Throwing a few pitches before the game is not enough to make sure that he's ready. You wait and see. You send Saberhagen out there, and then you send Derek Glow, the two most appropriate pitchers. Of course, the game almost got out of hand. The Indians scoring eight runs against them, none off Martinez. A one on Ramirez is foul, and all this does, I know it does in your mind. Cleveland fans look like they're in shock, and... Well, they should. Up two games to none, seemingly rolling toward the ALCS. They're down by three in the seventh inning of game five. This solidifies, in my mind, who's done the best job of any manager in the game this year. It's Jimmy Williams. Absolutely. And he's done it here in the postseason, as he did throughout the regular season for the Red Sox. And I know this is an arguable point, too, but this also solidifies, in my mind, why Pedro Martinez is not only the Cy Young Award winner, but the most valuable player in the American League. Two balls, one strike, two out, nobody on, and Ramirez is jammed, two and two. Eight players have driven in more than 165 runs during a regular season. All are in the Hall of Fame. Names like Wilson, Garrett, Greenberg, Fox, Ruth, Klein, DiMaggio, Thompson. And after driving in 165 runs during the regular season, this has been a nightmare postseason for Manny Ramirez. One hit, 17 at-bats, seven strikeouts, one RBI. Martinez trying to pitch four shutout innings here in game five. Still three and two on Ramirez. Mays never knocked in 165. Musial didn't. Aaron, Mantle, Williams. Manny Ramirez did it this year, but that is just statistics and right at this point, academic. For Ramirez, the Indians and their fans. Three balls, two strikes. 
two out, nobody on. Seventh inning. Inning over. Pedro Martinez strikes out six. He has worked four innings. And the Red Sox six outs away from the ALCS. Back from the dead, the Red Sox are the eighth team to lose the first two games of a best-of-five postseason series and then come back to force a decisive game five. Four of the previous seven teams to do it, and each of the last three have won. Last time it happened in the division series was in 95. Seattle overcoming the Yankees two games to none lead. 11-8, Boston out in front. Two balls, no strikes on Darren Lewis. Hard to believe here in Cleveland while Mike Jackson gets ready. We're in the eighth inning, 11-8, Boston, and that's a strike. Lewis one out of three tonight with a double. He scored the tying run in the fourth inning. Made it 8-8. Troy O'Leary's three-run homer on the heels of his grand slam back in the third made it 11-8. Down the right field line, pretty well hit. Ramirez back into the corner. There to make the catch for the out. One down here in the eighth inning. Don't forget, watch game three of the American League Championship Series here on Fox. The $1 million Gillette Strike Zone Challenge. One out, nobody on. The number nine hitter, Trot Nixon, over two with a walk and a run scored. Digs in against Shuey. Strike one. Baseball is such a game of little things. You look back in the seventh inning. Had Shuey allowed that ball to go through that grounder, no question, Biscal sucks that ball up. And then you have an out made by Dawback. You have two outs and nobody on with Garcia Parra coming up there. Obviously, you pitch to him. It doesn't set the scene for a guy like O'Leary. Big hits get all the headlines. Little things win games. One ball, two strikes on Nixon. And some big things are in the future for these Cleveland Indians. The team is up for sale. Got a team that had high hopes coming into the postseason. We are a long way away from the end of this one. This team is up for sale, and you have to make some decisions. When the new owners come in, whoever they may be, kind of a payroll are you working with? You've got a guy in Manny Ramirez who is a free agent after next season. Here it's said about Griffey, Alex Rodriguez, Sean Green, Carlos Delgado, add Manny Ramirez to the list. Potential free agents after next year and you're not going to sign him to a contract that might be $20 million a year. Well, this offseason maybe is the time to trade him. Those are decisions that face these Indians, two balls, two strikes, one out, nobody on. Nixon strikes out, two out. Bases empty here in the eighth inning. Back to the top of the order, Jose Offerman. You may or may not know that the Cleveland Indians are a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ. And if they lose this game tomorrow, look for a lot of sellers tomorrow morning early. Two out, nobody on, and the ball low and away to Offerman. Offerman tonight is singled, walked. One out of three. Hits it hard and foul and needs a new bat. You were talking about Pedro Martinez and why he could be not only the Cy Young, but MVP as well. Sporting News put together a formula to try to compare players against their league in certain eras, and then from within that, from era to era. It's difficult at this point to compare the game and the offensive numbers put up to any other era. I mean, you're putting up runs and hitting home runs at an incredible pace in the late 90s as we approach the new millennium. One ball, one strike. Offerman flies to center. Roberts there to put it away. A one, two, three inning. When Pedro Martinez 
goes back to the mound will finish the argument for why we feel he should be the MVP. The 1999 Division Series on Fox is brought to you by Chevrolet Trucks, the most dependable, longest-lasting trucks on the road. By Bud Light, for the great taste that won't fill you up and never lets you down, make it a Bud Light. By Gillette Mach 3, the first triple-blade razor. And by Intel's Web Outfitter service for Pentium 3 processor owners. Free at Intel.com. We welcome you back to Jacobs Field. We continue to talk about Pedro Martinez, who has yet to allow a hit since entering in the fourth inning. This season, when you compare his ERA to American League starters average at 5.05, it's even more drastic in comparing it to the league average ERA of 4.86. Strikeouts per nine innings. Opponents average, they hit only 205 against Martinez this season. You can argue this all day long. Many people feel that a pitcher should never win an MVP award. That's why they have Cy Young Awards. But there have been exceptions, and this, in our estimation, should be another exception to that rule as Martinez hits for strike one. One ball, one strike on Tomey with Baines and Cordero to follow. Eighth inning, 11-8 Boston. On a changeup, Tomey comes up empty, one and two. Side corner struck him out one away and that's seven strikeouts for Pedro Martinez and it's fitting that a strikeout just occurred one remarkable number after another strikeouts per nine innings this year the highest ever at per nine innings for a starting pitcher and look at the company Johnson Nolan Ryan Sandy Koufax Bob Feller Harold Baines takes the ball low and away. One out, nobody on. That's three consecutive strikeouts now for Pedro Martinez. Baines is 0 for 3 tonight. A 1-0. 2-0. Sporting News ranking individual seasons throughout baseball history. Babe Ruth's 1921 season is the greatest season, according to the Sporting News, in the history of this game by any one individual player. The age of 26, 1921, while playing for the Yankees, calling the Polo Grounds home. He hit 59 home runs, drove in 171 runs. Baines, 2-2. Two and two. 59 home runs, Tim, 12.4% of all the home runs hit in the American League, and to match that in 1999, a player would have had to hit 327 home runs. <laughs> oh, man. Wonderful. Two balls, two strikes, one out, nobody on. Baines took it down and in, full count. And the Indians look for any spark for some life here in the eighth inning. Number two season all-time, Greg Maddox in 1995 when he was 19 and two with an ERA of 1.63. 2.55 runs better than the league average. And the number three all-time season, position player, pitcher, Pedro Martinez and what he did in 1999. He issues a one-out walk to Harold Baines. And there is life for the Indians here in the eighth. Third walk handed out by Martinez. Keep in mind the Cleveland Indians with the best lineup in baseball, scoring 1,009 runs this year, the most runs scored by a team since the 1950 Red Sox. One on, one out. Will Cordero takes a strike. 49 come from behind victories this season, most in the American League, and they had to come from behind victory in game one of this division series here against the Red Sox. 
Cordero with a no-1 count. To third, Valentin will make the play at second for the second out. And these Indian fans, who are as loud and as involved in the game as any ballpark we visit. Absolutely. Hoping for another base runner to bring up the tying run. Tomorrow, 8 Eastern, Mets and Braves. Bob Costas, Joe Morgan, Jim Gray. The NLCS will get underway tomorrow night, and then we'll be back at you on Wednesday night, 8 Eastern. Either the Red Sox or the Indians at Yankee Stadium. One on, two out. And a strike over the outside corner to Freiman. Indians need another base runner here in the eighth inning. That's strike two. Freiman looked overmatched. in four and two-thirds innings for Martinez. Seven strikeouts, three walks. Fryman pops it up. Down the left field line, a long run. Garcia Parra there, and he makes the catch in between Valentin and O'Leary. Pedro Martinez and the Red Sox now three outs away from a date with the Yankees on Wednesday night. Are they ALCS bound? We go to the ninth inning. Red Sox up 11-8. Well, Mike Jackson, the closer for the Indians, takes over. He is out there to close nothing except the top of the ninth inning and try to keep it a three-run game. 39 saves during the regular season. He is the fourth pitcher of the night for Cleveland. Nagy, DePaula, Shuey, and Jackson. Valentin leads it off. Part of the order will bat again here for the Red Sox. Ball one. 11-8 Boston. Dahlbach and Garcia Parra will follow. One ball, one strike on Valentin. Indians, one game one, three, two. One game two, 11 to one. Series went back to Boston. Boston won game three, nine, three. With a six run seventh inning. A blowout last night, 23 seven Boston. Tonight, 11 eight in the ninth inning. Two strikes on Valentin. Boston Red Sox, who hope to advance to the next round of the playoffs. Valentin flies to center, and Roberts makes the catch. It's been well documented. It's been worn out. It's been beat up. But we will bring it up again. Since the Red Sox last World Series title, a World Series in which Babe Ruth pitching won two games. 1918, there have been 14 U.S. presidents, four U.S. wars, 14 Major League Baseball teams added, two U.S. states added. Babe Ruth's salary in 1918, $7,000. Price of a ticket at Fenway, 50 cents. And for our demographic, Prince has changed his name three times since the Red Sox last won the World Series. Interesting uh, to add to that Babe Ruth making $7,000 in 1918. At Pedro Martinez's, as you see the left-hander Real Cormier, Ramon Martinez, and Ron Beck, they've got three guys up in the bullpen. What's going on? I've never, you know, I haven't seen this in 30 years. Three guys going. The recruiting guys to catch up there. Got to use somebody else's bullpen to do that. One ball, one strike on Dahlbach, and that's down the left field line, and fair, into the corner. Dahlbach thinking double, and it is a double for Brian Dahlbach to 
put a runner in scoring position for Garcia Parra or O'Leary. No, it's not going to happen again, With is it? With one out here in the ninth inning. Come on, they're not going to walk Garcia Parra again, huh? They're almost right? shamed into pitching yeah, to him. That's here. right. Now the crowd will say pitch to him this time. Dahlbach lifted for a pinch runner. So his night has finished a three-hit night. Donnie Sadler, the pinch runner, at second base. And they will pitch to Garcia Parra, strike one. The ultimate sign of respect for Troy O'Leary in the night he's had here tonight. Garcia Parra intentionally walked in the third, O'Leary a grand slam. Garcia Parra intentionally walked in the seventh. O'Leary, the go-ahead three-run homer. And if Garcia Parra makes an out, it'll probably be O'Leary that'll be walked. The right-handed hitting Stanley behind O'Leary. Garcia Parra gets into one to left field. Cordero plays it off the wall. That'll score another run. Sandler to the plate safe. Garcia Parra into second safe. And it's 12-8 Boston. Forty-four runs scored by the Red Sox in the last three games. And now they will indeed walk O'Leary with Stanley to follow, and it's O'Leary's turn to get the intentional pass. And they are going wacky in Beantown. You can hear them all the way here in Cleveland. As Garcia Parra showed why they walked him intentionally earlier, as though he had to show it, right? Garcia Parra, who led the American League with his average of 357, is huffing, puffing down at second base as O'Leary. Probably tries to conceal a smile as he gets the intentional walk. And Joe, to sew up that point about Babe Ruth making $7,000, we figured it out today at Pedro Martinez's current salary, 3,200-plus pitches thrown this year. He makes more than $7,000 every two pitches he throws. Well, he's worth it tonight, and worth it for the Red Sox in 1999. Two on, one out. Stanley, strike one. Let's go down to Bob Brenly on the Red Sox side. Well, as Nomar Garcia Parra made his way up to the plate, several players on the Red Sox bench said, go ahead, walk him again. But obviously, <laughs> that was not the case. He doubled home a run, the intentional walk to O'Leary, and Stanley takes a strike. He's in the hole 0-2. Well, three guys warming up down in the bullpen. I wonder, Bob Brenly, if you think Pedro Martinez will trot back out there for the ninth inning. As Stanley strikes out two out. What do you well, think, Pedro Bob? Martinez is still in the first base dugout for the uh, Red Sox. As you know, three guys warming up in the bullpen. There's been no indication by Joe Kerrigan or Jimmy Williams whether Pedro will take the mound once again in the bottom of the ninth inning. We mentioned Ramon Martinez is getting loose out of the bullpen. He could very well start game one of the ALCS. That's right. I'd be awfully hesitant to bring him into a four-run game in the ninth inning. Somebody's got to start game one. If they get there. A four-run lead in the ninth inning. Two on, two out. Baratek took a strike. Red Sox leading by four, looking for more. Two out. Veritek took a ball. One ball, 
two strikes and Veritek stays alive. Everybody came in talking about the possibility of Pedro Martinez appearing in this game. He ended up tanking over in the fourth inning. He has not allowed a hit. We're in the ninth. Veritek another foul. 12-8 Boston lead. Boston Red Sox, a wild card team. They won the wild card by seven games over Oakland. They trailed the Yankees when the curtain came down on the regular season by four games. And it could be Boston, New York in the ALCS. The one-two to Veritek is grounded to Alomar. The flip for the out. And here we go into the bottom of the ninth inning. Martinez has thrown 86 pitches. He wants more. The Red Sox want more. They want three more outs for a trip to the American League Championship Series. Baseball's postseason rolls on and the house is rocking. That ball is gone. Got him at second base. And it's long gone. The American League Championship Series on Fox. Game one, Wednesday night, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. We welcome you back to the bottom of the ninth inning. Pedro Martinez taking his warm-up tosses. Why don't we show you Babe Ruth? Sold to the Yankees for the 1920 season. The curse of the Bambino. And those in Boston have to be thinking that maybe the best way, as we close out the millennium, the best way to try to get rid of the curse is to have to go through the Yankees the team they sold Ruth to for the 1920 season to get to the World Series. Coming up next, local news, except on the West Coast. And for more post-game coverage of this one, tune into your local Fox Sportsnet cable station. Enrique Wilson is off the bench to bat for Alomar. And he takes the ball. It'll be Enrique Wilson. Then Roberts, who is at least in the on-deck circle. And then Vizquel. One ball, one strike. 88 pitches for Pedro Martinez. Would you run him back out there for the ninth inning? Yes, I would. Yep. I take, no, ch I take no chances right now. Particularly uh, throwing only 86 pitches. Richie Sexton waits on bit on the bench with 116 RBIs so does David Justice I would imagine Justice if his neck were okay would be the pinch hitter for Roberts but he shows no sign of taking his jacket off the 2-1 to the left side Garcia Parra in the hole fires got it what a play Nomar Garcia Parra in the hole takes a leadoff hit away from Enrique Wilson. Jimmy Williams telling us before the game that as much as any play on the infield, Garcia Parra works on this play. Going to his right, throwing back across his body with that whip-like motion, that life strength of uh, that right arm. I mean, he has a cannon, too. And now with one out, nobody on, Dave Roberts is at the plate. I don't understand that. You've got Richie Sexton over there. Yeah. I mean, at least Richie Sexton. If you're not going to use Dave Justice, you've got to use Richie Sexton. Don't you? 116 RBIs. The 0-1. Crowd wanted Roberts to take one off the shoe tops. Take one for the team and get a base runner here in the ninth inning. He got out of the way. One ball, one strike. Red Sox lead by four, ninth inning. Hard hit right at Garcia Parra. Two up, two down. And the Red Sox are one out away from their first American League Championship Series since 1990. These two have never met in the postseason. Of course, that one-game playoff in 1978 does not count as postseason baseball. 
Red Sox won this season series eight games to four, so they have handled the Yankees at least during the regular season. There's a strength of his Cal as the Indians are down to their final out in 1999, an offense that scored 1,009 runs and a team that ran away with the American League Central Division title and now down to their final strike. Pedro Martinez has not allowed a hit since entering in the fourth inning. He has walked three, he struck out seven. He has Vizquel set up at 0-2. That's down the left field line foul. The last time the Red Sox were in the ALCS, 1990, they were swept by Oakland as they were in the ALCS in 1988. Jimmy Williams telling Troy O'Leary, move toward the line, the left field line. Down two games to none, the Boston Red Sox have come storming back, and they are in the American League Championship Series. No hits allowed by Pedro Martinez from the fourth inning on. Jimmy Williams allowing the players to celebrate. First manager that I saw do that was Tom Kelly with the 1987 world champion Minnesota Twins. Red Sox and their fans hoping that this year they can change the curse into the purse. So the Cleveland Indians up two games to none. It's been a 51-year drought for the Indians. They last won a world championship in 1948. They are out, and the Red Sox move on and will face the Yankees on Wednesday night in New York. A remarkable, remarkable come-from-behind victory in this series for Jimmy Williams and the Boston Red Sox. A scrappier crew you will never find on a big league baseball diamond. An upset victory for the Red Sox in this division series. And let's take you down to Bob Brentley, Bob. Thank you, Joe. Standing by with Troy O'Leary. Troy, I know you want to go celebrate with your teammates, but what an outstanding performance when all the marbles are on the line. It was a tough game tonight. Uh, Pedro did a great, great job. Nomar came in, hit it to my home, Bob. You know, I just, I haven't been hitting that well, but tonight, you know, we just are, we came out. Tommy was beating up on us, and uh, it's just a great win tonight. A little extra inspiration because they walk no more ahead of you twice. Yeah, it happened twice, but you know, it happens. That's part of baseball. Congratulations, outstanding ball game, Troy. All right, Bob, thank you very much. The celebration continues. And now back toward the clubhouse for the Boston Red Sox. Offerman already there. Nomar Garcia Parra is absolutely swamped as well he should be. And Pedro Martinez is next on our list as he stands by with Bob Brentley for an interview. Bob Brentley, take it away. I'm on the field with Pedro Martinez. Pedro, I don't even know if we're on TV right now, but I'd love to talk to you. Did you know you were going to pitch in this ball game when you got here today? Well, I wasn't sure. But uh, depending on, on how Xavier Hagen felt, I, I decided that, that I was just going to give it all. And I came out and I felt better than, than I thought, and I just went on from there. I saw Jimmy Williams talking to you in the dugout, and I think it was the second inning. What did he say to you at that point? I, I just went up to him and I said, I, I feel like, we're, like we need to send me down right now. We don't need to let it go out and, and out of the open and, and uh, I just hold on to it while we have time. Peter, six innings of no-hit ball. Do you wish you would have started this game? I wish I could have, but I, but I didn't know how I was going to feel. And if I came out early and, and, and the team was going to go down. So I decided to just wait and, and see what I could do to help the team and, and hopefully pump them up whenever we needed it. Well, now you and your teammates can look forward to the Yankees. What do you think about facing off with the Yankees in the ALCS? Well, right now, with the momentum we have, we, we're not afraid of facing anybody. And, and the Yankees are a team that we always play hard and, and and we have all the respect for them but we're gonna play them as hard as we can what about your physical status going into the ALCS how do you feel right now well right now it's, it's just a little tired but but uh, I managed to hang on and now I'll have some time to 
go back in there in the training room and keep working. I will let you go back in there and celebrate your teammates. Congratulations, Pedro. Great performance. Thank you. Joe, back up to you. All right, Bob, and congratulations to Pedro Martinez. Our producer, Mike Weissman, our director, Bill Webb, associate director, Aaron Stoikov, our broadcast associate, Derek Manning, our editorial consultant here in the booth, Steve Horn. It has been a pleasure, an honor, to bring you tonight's game, game five of this division series. We all say goodbye to the Cleveland Indians, a tremendous ball club that came up one victory short in the division series with Boston, a team that won 97 games, scored over 1,000 runs, but they are gone. Tonight belongs to the Red Sox. They move on for a date with their rival, the New York Yankees, on Wednesday night here on Fox, where the American League Championship Series begins. That'll do it from all of us here in Cleveland. A big night for Troy O'Leary. A bigger night for Pedro Martinez. The Indians are out. The Red Sox move on. For Tim McCarver and Bob Brenly, I'm Joe Buck. So long from Jacobs Field. Final score here, 12-8 Red Sox. They win the series three games to two. Right now, here's Keith Oberman and Steve Lyons in the Fox Television Center. Take a deep breath. The ALCS begins on Wednesday night. Good night. All right, Joe, the Boston Red Sox become the first team ever to rally from down 0-2 in a best-of-five series and win the fifth game on the road. Steve Lyons made the prediction beforehand that this was probably going to be one of those games that ended 12 to 10. Well, you're off by a little bit, but 12 to 8, we'll give it to you. And I, and I don't care because I'm so exhausted, I can't believe it, but I'll tell you what, this game is just was unbelievable. Jimmy Williams, it's tough to figure this guy out, but that's why he is the manager of the year this year. you got to wonder about a guy who throws six shutout innings, but doesn't start the ball game, but then gets it done for you. Troy O'Leary, they walk Nomar twice to get to him. He comes through two times huge with two big home runs, and isn't it going to be nice to see Roger Clemens pitching a playoff game in Boston for the Yankees? Yeah, and uh, to continue that switched analogy between New York and Boston and all of the rivalry therein, if you want to make a comparison for Pedro Martinez tonight, the most apt one in sports history is probably Willis Reed, the center of the New York Knicks coming off the bench in 1970 when everybody thought he wasn't going to be able to play. And now it will be the fourth postseason meeting ever between baseball teams from New York and Boston, if you count the Brooklyn Dodgers. But the Red Sox versus the Yankees. The playoff game in 78, they've decided three pennants on the last day of the season. Can we calculate what a championship series between the Yankees and the Red Sox will be like? Well, I mean, no one's ever given the Red Sox any credit at all. They weren't supposed to get past this round, and everybody's going to say that they're not going to get past the Yankees. But I'll tell you what, we talked about on the pregame show. This team has a ton of heart. Their pitching is in shambles right now. they got a bunch of guys banged up. But I'm going to tell you, Troy O'Leary comes through. John Ballantin was a forgotten guy, comes through. This team plays with a lot of guts, so you never know what can happen. The Yankees, are they going to be favored in this? No question. A lot of people will say they'll be out in four games. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to say anything like that against the Red Sox. Hey, I played for these guys. What do you think? And the way things are going, you may play for them again before this series <laughs> no is over. No chance. They don't need me. But, for, but don't forget the wild card in this deal, the news that we had before the game about Paul O'Neill's fractured rib. He may not even be on the roster for this series, so anything could happen as the ALCS starts on Wednesday night right here on Fox. Steve and I will be joining you uh, for the pregame show from Yankee Stadium, and then we'll travel to Fenway Park, and Lord, that should be interesting.